Clarogo. This winter, more than ever, with COVID-19 still circulating, we need help to reduce all avoidable risks. You can help protect the NHS, social care and loved ones by getting the flu vaccine. You may be eligible for the free vaccine at your GP or local pharmacy if you are over 65, pregnant or have a long-term condition. Find out if you are eligible at nhs.uk forward slash stay well. Children up to year seven can get the free nasal spray at school or through their GP if they are below school age. If you are not eligible for the free vaccine, you can pay for it at your local pharmacy. The flu vaccination does not give you flu. It reduces the risk of catching flu as well as spreading it to others. If you had the vaccination in the past, that will not protect you as the flu strain changes every year, so you need to have a new one this year. It is also important to wash your hands often with warm water and soap. Use tissues when you cough or sneeze and bin used tissues as quickly as possible. Thank you for helping to protect yourself and loved ones this winter.
we're all live. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the meeting of the Communities in Place Committee, which is being held remotely with the majority of the 11 members joining the meeting from their own homes. Um, can I ask you to take over there, please, Noel? Yes, just for the uh, benefit of the broadcast, I'll uh, read out the attendees and the procedures for the meeting this morning. Um, as well as the chair, the committee members present today are the vice chairs, John Handley and Phil Rostens, Pauline Allen, Jim Creamer, Glyn Gilfoyle, turns page, Kevin Greaves, Vaughan Hopewell, Tom Hollis, Bruce Lawton, and John Ogle. Councillor Gordon Wheeler and Councillor Maureen Dobson are also in attendance. We also have the following officers present today. Uh, Corporate Director Adrian Smith, Service Director Derek Higdon, uh, Group Manager Sally Gill. Um, Inspire Culture is represented by Peter Gall and Kirsty Blythe and via East Midlands by Doug Coots. Uh, managers Pete Matheson and Martin Carnaffin are attending today and other officers may be called upon to provide information during the meeting. These will be introduced at the appropriate time. The meeting uh, of the committee is being held in line with the requirements of the Coronavirus Act 2020. So do please bear with us if we experience any technical issues. If we do lose members, of the committee from the call temporarily officers will seek to assist them in getting them reconnected as soon as possible hopefully without the need to halt proceedings officers uh, will inform the meeting if they are unable to rectify the problem and if we need the meeting to be paused or adjourned temporarily i would ask members uh, to refer to agenda pack page numbers during discussions and finally can i ask that you keep your microphones on mute um, when not addressing the committee, as this minimises sound distortions on the team meeting. Th thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Noel. Um, we'll go straight to item one, which is the minutes of the last meeting held on the 7th of January. Um, can I ask the committee if the minutes can be agreed, please? Is there no formal vote, but just a nod of the heads of those I can see? And if anybody has, thank you. If anybody has any issues please put your hand up okay we we'll take that as agreed thank you item two is apologies for uh, absence thank you no uh, no apologies received uh, chair uh, all all members of the committee are present today thank you item three is declarations of interest do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare and do any members or officers present have any private interests to declare? Any declarations? Chairman. Yes. Sorry. Chair Lynn. Chairman, yeah. I just, just want to clear. Uh, obviously, I'm one of two members along with yourself. This uh, is the other member, uh, board member of Inspire, Chairman. OK. And I'd ask the clerk to note that I am yes, board chairman. member as well. Yep. Mr. Chairman, uh, Via, uh, I'm a board member of Via. I ought to declare that I think uh, today. Okay, thank you. Any other declarations? No. Councillor Hollis. Mr. Chairman, I'm. I see we're discussing libraries today. I'm. I'm a member of the National Accreditation Board for Libraries. Okay, thank okay. you. OK, I see no more hands, so thank you very much for that. So we move to item four, fees and charges for 2021-2022 for libraries, archives and information. Uh, can I ask Peter Gore if he would like to present, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members. Um, this is our annual report um, that comes to this committee um, from Inspire to seek permission to uh, levy a range of uh, fees and charges for our libraries and archive service. Um, so the report sets out um, our current range of fees and charges in Appendix 1 and 2, and it highlights in bold where we've proposed a range of changes and adjustments. Um, as you can see in paragraph 8, um, the proposals, a small increase in costs related to memory sticks that people purchase in libraries, uh, additional charges for the recently refurbished rooms at Retford Library uh, for room hire, 
and a slight reduction in the change for one of the meeting rooms at Arnold Library um, to meet uh, to reflect customer feedback on the on the current level of charges. And then in paragraph nine uh, it relates to appendix two, which relates to charges and changes um, made by the archive services, um, which relates to general uh, changes in in a range of charges that we have to then pass on to our customers. Um, the uh, uh, the need to make sure our charges are in line with the Church of England uh, table of parochial fees um, and then uh, in, in increasing the charges we make for translations and transcriptions costs that relates to the hourly rate um, that we pay our staff. So those, those are the, 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 the uh, changes that are proposed within the report. Um, I should have also just introduced my colleague Kirsty Blythe who's um, Assistant Chief Executive Inspire and operationally manages the library service um, who authored the report. So any detail, uh, Kirsty would be happy to pick up. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'd like to f formally move the recommendation on page seven. Do I have a seconder, please? Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments for Peter and Kirsty? Yes, Councillor Hollis. Thank you, Chairman. I just will welcome Peter as well and thank you for the report. Um, and I think it's obviously really great to see that overall we're not going to be increasing charges. I know we've, he, he listed a few nominal changes there, but overall charges staying the same. And I really welcome that. Um, I don't think members would be surprised to hear me say as well that I'd of course like to see libraries opening hours improved across Nottinghamshire, but I know that's something that I'm sure Peter feels the same, but any efforts we can do to improve that um, whether it be improving opening hours um, on their own but also improving the mobile library service uh, is something that we feel very passionately about but, but also Mr Chairman relating to the report um, we suggested with the police uh, for instance a partnership working um, this was brushed off by Paddy Tippin maybe for example police officers holding surgeries um, in some of our libraries trying to get people in um, and obviously bringing a bit of revenue into the service. That's just one example of partnership working, but Peter, I was hoping you could maybe outline um, some other partnership working that's being considered or anything that you think potentially would work. Um, obviously with the aim of not only getting football into the libraries and using the buildings, but also bringing a bit of revenue into the service. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Creamer next and Peter can ask you to come in yeah, afterwards. Certainly. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jim. Chair. My, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Mine's just a clarification, but a very simple one, actually. Just on the um, memory sticks, what actual size are they? I mean, for the uh, for say there are several different sizes. We might be missing a marketing opportunity. <laughs> he might have forgotten, Jim. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, Councillor Vaughan. Yeah, Councillor Vaughan Hopewell. Thank you. Uh, you not mute. You're not unmuted at the uh, moment, Vaughan. Yep. No, you you muted again. That's yep. better, isn't it? Yes. Right. Okay. My question is really regarding the replacement charge for lost or damaged stock. Um, I notice that there's no charge for under 14s, but then the four, 14 plus played the pay the full price. I'm just wondering that 14 plus seems a little bit on the young side for someone who's studying or whatever. Um, could that not be raised to say 16 or 18? I can't see any other hands. Anybody else with any questions? Okay, uh, Peter and Kirsty, I'll come back to you if you may. OK, I'll, I'll just pick up Councillor Hollis's point. Um, so in terms of opening opening hours, um, uh, we were pleased to report in our annual report that we presented to this committee in September that um, we'd achieved a six and a half percent increase in opening hours across the network through um, partnership working and through f more flexible working of our own staff. So that so we have we have shifted the dial um, on that and um, did a major piece of work last week last year on surveying with our customers and our staff about the most appropriate hours as well. So um, we try to reduce things like lunchtime closing and um, evening sessions where they're, they're not, not being taken up. So we did quite a lot of work last year, but it's something that we've 
always got an eye on on the opportunities and i think in a in a post covid environment we'll we'll be looking very closely at patterns of opening hours and how we deliver the service in relation to mobile libraries um they're having a bit of a renaissance at the moment um they're very very busy um do uh, doing outreach services uh collect and click click and collect and delivery to um uh uh, uh, more remote communities um, and they are very <laughs> extremely popular and, and, and sort of uh, demonstrating their worth so so there is investment and and the council is um, in a program of replacing the vehicles so we, we're due two new vehicles so the, the fleet will be completely re, um, updated as it were so 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 that's that's an example of, of that I think the partnership uh, question is is absolutely uh, timely um we've just been through an lga review which talked to us around some of those issues i think we've got a good track record of partnership um partnership uh, yeah hosting surgeries we host surgeries for some councillors around this table um and for some district councillors and we're always up for that um so we, we're happy to talk to and we're happy to talk to the police and we had have had um police contact points in libraries um either on a i'd had ad hoc basis or on a kind of room hire basis over the many, many years. So two, two partnerships to outline, uh, Blidworth Parish Council and the library service are working together um, to host the parish office and at the same time the uh, the library service is providing a front desk for the parish council which has allowed the library service to increase its opening hours in Blidworth by about another seven or eight hours. So that's an example of um, everybody working together to to improve services and, and to work more efficiently. Um, and we are uh, also working uh, quite a lot this year and, and in the next couple of years with ABL Health, which is the council's public health um, wellbeing provider, um, both in terms of them using our spaces um, and also working together um, to deliver health and well-being outcomes in, in some of our more deprived communities. So there, there's quite a lot of partnership working, but um, we do rely on our contacts and, and sometimes through local county councillors to, to make join those things up for us as well. So um, we're always open to those discussions. In, in relation to the, the size of the memory stick, I don't have that information about me, um, but Councillor Creamer, I, I can assure you there'll be very good value and enough data storage for uh, our customers' needs. I don't think, I don't know if Kirsty wants to add in there, if she's got now, she's shaking her head uh, vi vigorously. Um, in terms of the uh, the charging threshold for lost items, um, yes, it, it, it is one of those things that we've debated over the years of where we set the line. Um, we tend to set the line between um, the definition of children and young people and and adults are around at 14 and it kind of it kind of suits the rest of the kind of policies on on the library system in reality when we've looked at this um, the amount of lost items that do occur uh, in that age group are, are quite small so it's it's more of a deterrent for people um, not to lose items um, and i think we're very keen to maintain the free under 14 where some library services would institute charges for that, which then obviously stops some families and children accessing the library service. Um, on the whole, um, our stock loss rate is about 5%. We measure it for our auditors, um, which is quite quite low comparatively. So we do quite a good job. And because and that, that relies on the customers bringing items back, which I think, you know, we've got a good track record on. So um, we could debate where you draw the line, I think, a lot, but we think it's probably the right point at the moment. Thank you, Peter. I don't think there's anybody else. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we'll move to the vote then, please, for the recommendation. Are there any votes against? Are there any abstentions? No, thank you. I take it then that we're agreed unanimously and uh, the recommendation is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you, Chair. And we move to item five uh, relating to the highways asset management. Um, I'd like to formally move the recommendation, which is on page 40 of the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder? I'll second that, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm Councillor Gordon Wheeler, I'm going to give you the opportunity before um, Martin Canaffin or Ian Patchett. I, I don't know who will be talking to the afterwards. If you want to say a few words first, Councillor Wheeler. 
Thank you, John. Really much, much appreciated. Um, as, as you just said, I'm not sure whether it's uh, Ian or Martin that's going to be uh, speaking to the support. What I will say is, um, this, my committee, as you have the recommendations of my committee in this paper before you, I've done a lot of work talking to officers uh, to understand the system, to understand the process. And as it says in paragraph seven in particular, um, we need to, uh, we need, so, sorry, paragraph, uh, paragraph eight, second bullet point, we need to, uh, adopt a proactive rather reactive in other words get to the problem before it becomes a problem uh, hopefully this is what ian will say in his report i'm very happy if, if with your permission john to uh, to add anything further once uh, ian stroke martin done the presentation to supplement some further comments if those are if there's anything which hasn't already been covered again with your permission john that's okay that's fine councillor wheeler okay i'll hand over to martin then please thank you martin <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, members, as well. Um, myself and Ian will both be presenting, so I'm about to share my screen with you, so hopefully you'll be able to pick up the presentation without any issue. What we'll do is myself and Ian will... Um, we're doing this jointly, so when we get to the point where Ian takes over from me, I will drop out and Ian will take over and start sharing his screen with you. With you. Uh, if it's okay with members, I'd like to leave questions to the end. It just makes everything flow a bit easier. So the first slide I've got up is just... Martin, uh, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're still seeing your um, notes view. Oh, uh, gosh. So you might, no, don't worry at all. So you might need to just um, jig, juggle a little to get us your slideshow view. Thank you. You're a spoil sport, Adrian. <laughs> Didn't want you getting ahead. Are you seeing the full, just the display now? No, I'm afraid we're just, not, Martin. Just need to share your screen again. Okay. I apologise for this. Is that working OK now? Perfect. Well done. That's <laughs> Thank you very much. It's the scourge of the modern age. Don't worry, Martin. <laughs> the floor's yours. Thank you. So the first slide I've, I've put up, it, it lists out some of Nottinghamshire's assets. And, and don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to go through them all. I just wanted to pick out a few headlines to give you some idea of the scale of, of the network. So altogether, we've got 4,438 kilometres of, of roads. That's the A, B, seasonal classified. And to put that into some context, it's just 970 kilometres from Land's End to John O'Groats as the, the crow flies. There's also another couple of asset categories in there I'd like to draw your attention to, which we don't often talk about in committee. Uh, these are the street lighting columns. We've got 90, approximately 94,000 of those. And highway structures, we've got 1,211 of those. So we've got quite a a large and diverse asset portfolio. And to give you some sort of idea of the value of that asset, if we were to build it from, from you, um, it would cost 10.7 billion. And that would include the, the value of the land that we own as well. So you know, that makes it by far the, you know, the biggest asset which Notts County Council maintains. And this slide here will show you where those 4,438 kilometers of network are. So uh, this slide breaks down the road length by district and each of those districts you can see there's a number of uh, coloured sections to it that's how you know, that shows you the different categories of, of road the how each district's made up so 
as you can imagine, Bassett Law and Newark being predominantly rural areas, they, they have a, a high proportion of the network, whereas Ashfield, Bassett Law, Gedling and Mansfield being predominantly urban in aspect have lower proportions of network length with Rushcliffe falling in between. And, and why do we spend all this money maintaining it? So it's a legitimate, legitimate question. Well, there's a there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, it's it's true. It is a vital asset. It's you know, virtually every journey or delivery which is made in Nottinghamshire will be on the highway at some point. Um, you know, if emergency services want to attend any instant, they'll be on the highway. So it, it's vital for our economy and our way of life. And you know, we'll see that from of what's happened with COVID and the amount of deliveries that are being made to people's homes. Secondly, the county council is a highway authority. It's got a statutory duty to keep the highway safe. So if we don't, we'll end up in court and people will claim against us. Uh, thirdly, um, following on from that statutory duty, um, if people you know, do make claims against us, it'll increase our insurance premiums. And we don't want to be spending money on, on insurance premiums. We actually want to be spending on highway maintenance, which is, after all, what it was given for us to do in the first place. And finally, it's just the right thing to do. And we all, as officers and members, want to keep residents safe as they travel around the county. This slide shows how highway, highway maintenance is funded. Uh, this is for the uh, current financial year. And for the purposes of our discussion, I think the, the 14.57 million, which is the third figure down, is the, the, the most interesting one. 2.5 million of that is made up of incentive funding. And we get that from um, the DFT self-assessment questionnaire, which we do every year. It's a robust document. It has to be signed off by a Section 151 officer. And one of the fundamental lines of inquiry within it is whether we've embed, embodied the principles of sound asset management practice. So we're currently at a band three authority, which is the highest possible rating. But if we were a band two, we'd only get 30% of that. And if we were a band one, we wouldn't get any of it. So you could see if we're not shown to be acting in accordance with best practice, it can affect us quite significantly. And the final slide I'll put it before I hand over to Ian. It gives us some gives you some performance data for 2019-20. The percentage figures in black, uh, they're, the, um, they're the percentage of the road network which should be considered for maintenance for each category of road and the uh, percentage figures in green are our targets. So as you can see, we've met our targets for the A, Bs and Cs, but um, not for the unclassified roads. And that's where we've concentrated the additional capital count, uh, capital money that we've been uh, given in recent years. So at this point, I'll hand over to Ian. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me OK? I, I can hear you fine, Ian. Yeah, OK. So. Um... Um, picking up on Martin's slide where he just finished there, those targets there are what we call the road condition indicator. It's, it's extremely historical measure um, and it basically measures the roads that are effectively in the red or approaching the end of their life. So what that means is not not those roads that may require some preventative maintenance, which is kind of we'll get to that in a few moments, but it's those that roads that are absolutely pretty much finished. Um, and it's very, very much what we like to call a worst first indicator. So moving on, this looks fairly complicated graph at first. Um, if you think of the red curve on there, um, which is there, it's a fairly straightforward deterioration curve, basically proving the fact that roads will deteriorate over time. The green lines you can see on there towards the top, they're indicative of more frequent um, non-invasive treatments such as surface dressing and, um, and micro asphalt for example and that's more of a preservative type of treatment which um, aims to restore roads um, at a more at a cheaper cost but you have to do this more frequently obviously uh, and it, it proves that over time this is a more beneficial way of doing it than it is waiting for roads to ultimately fail and then spending massive amounts of money on uh, on rebuilding them so Worst first, what is, what is it? Well, there's always been an element of surface dressing in the annual capital maintenance programme, for example, but on the whole, Nottinghamshire has historically followed a worst first methodology when picking sites for treatment. And this is easily understood by the general public, um, particularly when they're you know, badgering their local representatives, such as yourselves, 
um, because everyone knows what a terrible road surface looks like. Uh, generally full of potholes, repaired or otherwise, utility reinstatements, trenches, maintenance, patching, and above all else, the ride quality is usually um, quite poor. So everyone can see and recognise this, and it's not difficult to understand why, why people get annoyed about it. Um, in terms of a, the principles of asset management, they differ slightly from worst first. So by following worst first, essentially only treating those roads and footways which have reached the end of their life, so that they're, they're at the foot of the deterioration curve, uh, and not cons also considering those sites which are beginning to fail, but overall less deteriorated, you're effectively allowing a whole raft of sites to eventually reach the end of their useful life um, unchecked. In, in short, by only treating what's in the red box, you're allowing all those sites that are in the long red rectangle to uh, to slide down and eventually meet them. So effectively, every road in the county is somewhere on that curve. So the application of good asset management principles then can't rely solely on input from the general public, um, councillors such as yourselves and so on. It requires vast amounts of high quality data as well, because ultimately the decisions we make are human decisions, whether that's uh, approval at committee. But the most, the more relevant data we can um, we can use to uh, to to throw at the issue, if you like, means that that ultimate human decision is less is is less prone to error, uh, less less prone to risk, and more likely to be more accurate because the the usable data that we've had. So where is it at the moment? Right now, we've got data in uh, numerous places. It's in hard copy on file, it cabinets, even digital data can be squirrelled away and hidden on servers or even on the hard drives of individual computers and laptops. We've all done it. It's no one's fault, everyone's busy, everyone's trying to do the best job they can. So how do we improve this situation? How do we obliterate the silos where people and teams are often operating in isolation? Or well, there's a vast amount of data being subject to manual handling, it's emailed between parties and so on. We have an asset management system, or HAMS as, as we like to call it. Uh, and what we have at the most, a system called Confirm, which has uh, been embedded for probably about 15 years now. There's a lot of data in there. A lot of it is the street, the street gazetteer information, uh, geometric information on footways, lengths and widths and so on, features, spot features like gullies and bridges uh, and street lighting, the extents of the, of the highway envelope itself um, and routes that we use for gritting and, in, and uh, highway inspections, for example. Everything's plotted using um, GPS, which means we get to the main reason for having a robust hams in the first place, which is quite simply, you know, it's it's your primary tool for helping keep the network safe, and it and it and it defends the authority against third party claims as well. You know, so we know what it is, whether that's a pothole, a gritting route, or an inspection, or we know where it is because everything is GPS located, and we know when it is because every activity on the system is time and date stamped. Better yet, one version of the truth in one place, so it's not stored in those various places and being emailed backwards and forwards. You never know if you're looking at the uh, the most you know the most frequent version or the most recent version, should I say? And with a high quality asset management system, there is only one version. So thinking about our activities on the highway, you know, carriageways and footways and cycleways at the moment, they, they fall into three types at the moment. Cyclic is your routine maintenance. Frequencies can be adjusted due to the level of risk. Um, gullies, for example, are now cleansed at various frequencies depending on the amount of silt level they've got in them and also what type of road they're on, you know, the, um, the how busy they are. And then there's planned maintenance, which will it certainly be familiar to uh, uh, to you guys because that what goes through um, communities in place for approval. Those are the plan works, the major schemes. Um, and then there's the reactive, which is the day to day, you know, filling potholes, if you like, attending to safety defects, um, gritting um, after a spell of um, cold weather and so on. Now, right into the equation comes preventative maintenance, which is which is kind of at the heart of what Councillor Wheeler uh, was mentioning right at the start call it planned patching if you like, but this involves the use of machinery to help us carry out robust patching, which due to the fact we can plan ahead, is far more efficient than reactive patching, which by definition will always be inefficient. It's vital because it's necessary to defend the authority against claims and keep the network safe. Um, category one actionable defects, for example, but they can incur extra costs in non-productive mileage and so on. So what we like to do is is, is plan ahead and do the patching a little bit better. And why do we do this? What's the reason for it and what is it? So the reason we go to a particular site might be a reactive one from an inquiry, um, from yourselves, from the public, um, or it might even be from our own inspection re uh, regime. 
excessive pothole repairs or reactive patching, utility trenches, cracking, loss of stone or whatever it is. However, once we leave the site, we aim to have carried out enough works to have created a preventative outcome, which in simple terms means when the highway inspector next visits the site on, on his routine, routine rounds, there's no actionable defects to be found, which also leads to less impact on the county council's revenue budget down the line as well. So the, the concept is we'll be doing less reactive maintenance because we've future proof the network as best we can. Um, how do we do this? Brief look at some of the machinery involved, um, small scale planing machines there, which can do discrete areas. We have a hot box for keeping material on site at a usable temperature, so that reduces the amount of mileage and um, you know, traveling backwards and forwards to, uh, to the tarmac plant and such like. And it's usually a hand lay operation, although we can fetch machinery in for, for bigger areas. Um, treatment types, surface dressing is, is completely non-invasive and it, that is also a preventative measure and, and you see surface dressing um, schemes on the capital maintenance programme every year as well. Usually it's a highly polished road surface which carries a risk for skidding and such like, so it could be a road safety issue. Um, and it's an application of a, of, a, of a binder, sticky binder, covered with chippings and this seals the road surface and stops the ingress of water and, and water inside the, 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 the Foot carriageway and footway pavements is the, is the, the worst thing in the world um, because that's where you get the freeze thaw effect where the expansion can pop roads out you know the, it's, it's, it's uh, quite interesting we're having this presentation at this time of year when we, we, we are front and center with that kind of thing going on with the, the temperatures changing all the time and many roads are suffering because of it and um, note the cost estimate at the top corner there for every pound spent here then you get into more invasive treatment types such as resurfacing this can involve the planing off of the layers and of course the, the condition of the road in the in the first instance is usually um, a little bit more severe than, than just being polished up and of course for every pound you spend on preventative maintenance that can be as much as four times as much at this sort of stage and we're still not going particularly deep here we're, we're planing the top surface off and, and such like and these are those roads which are you know beyond micro asphalt beyond preventative so we've actually got to take some um, some serious action and the worst end of it thinking about the um, those rows that have reached the end of their life you're into reconstruction which is a, which is a deeper process this this can be you know two or three hundred millimeters down in some cases but uh, it's mainly two coat for the most part and of course cost goes up again um, and for every pound spent on surface dressing or micro asphalt you might be spending 12 times that on um, on reconstruction works and the most the best thing to remember here is while we try and balance this and we still have to do some of these roads every year of course we can't ignore um, the worst roads but because we have the cycle of inspection and keeping them safe they may not always be aesthetically pleasing we know that they may not always ride particularly nicely but they are safe and that's the uh, primary concern um, so back to a deterioration curve again the prioritization is is the most important part of this still following asset management principles so if you think about the area on the uh, on the curve this 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 sort of area here where the, the uh, deterioration has just started that's where your surface dressings and your micro asphalts can kick in we're still exploring how far down the deterioration curve you can go with micro asphalt and still you know fetch these sites back from the brink at limited cost and of course for every resurfacing scheme you can do you can do four or more uh, micro asphalt sites um, and you cover more ground that way. So we look for critical sites in each condition band, the ones that must be attended to first before they tip over into a more expensive treatment. It's not a tipping point, it's more of a zone. And as I say, we're still exploring the, the limits of this. And of course, the very worst roads are still not ignored, but we prioritise those accordingly as well. Um, and for example, we might do that by which ones are generating the most repairs. Um, again, if they're already um, eating into the revenue budget considerably, then we will prioritise those accordingly. And we mitigate the risk of failure by carrying out preventative maintenance earlier in the deterioration curve. Um, prevention is better than cure. Um, either they're close to requiring more expensive treatment or already a burden on the county council's budget. And those are effectively the, um, the principles of asset management. And I'll, uh, at this point, I'll thank you for listening. I'll hand you back to Martin. Thanks, Eden. Flushed with the success of trying to share the screen last time, I'll have another go. Right, first time. Right, excellent. That's good stuff. <laughs> so, um, 
I just want to say a few words about highway structures of you know, the, the 1,211 structures which uh, I introduced earlier. Um, there's a, a list of the, the sorts of things we've got. I'm not going to go through them all, but it gives you a, a view of, of what they are. And, and there's some interesting structures in there. So there's over 150 concrete bridges. There's over 150 masonry arch bridges and over 40 cast iron and steel and wrought iron bridges. Uh, and that includes the, the A634 Blythe Bridge, which was constructed in 1770, which is a grade one listed building, and 30 other grade one or listed, sorry, grade one or two listed bridges in the county. And the cumulative value of all of those structures alone is 550 million. So we, uh, the, the inspection uh, uh, regime for structures is set out in the County Council's Highway Infrastructure Asset Management Plan and the table from is there on the left hand side which sets out how we do it. Uh, I'll just summarise a couple of, of key facts around it. So general inspections, so that'll be a, a remote visual inspection, will be, be carried out every two years. And then principal inspections, and that's an inspection at touching distance, uh, takes place over uh, railway bridges and major rivers every six years. Uh, and on other items of uh, like subways culverts every six to 12 years if the risk assessment allows or otherwise every six years. And um, underwater inspections will be carried out every three years. Um, VIA also undertake a, an annual bridge painting programme. So you'll see bridges like um, Lady Bay Bridge being repainted every nine years. And on top of all this as well, there's a programme of general repairs which are carried out during the inspection regimes. Uh, and they carry out items of larger maintenance, such as concrete repairs, parapet replacements, bridge deck waterproofing, you know, maintenance of that sort of ilk. Um, the level of service which we achieve is, is measured using ADEPTS, that's the Association of Directors of Environment, Economy, Planning and Transports um, Bridge Condition Indicator System. Um, these BCI results, uh, they form part of the dashboard, which we use to manage the contract with VIA EM. And uh, I've included a, a little bit of a dash, you know, excerpt of the dashboard there on the right hand side. I understand you, you won't be able to see it, but I just wanted to show you what it looked like so you get a flavour of the sorts of data we get. Um, Adept say our BCI score should be, between, should be between 80 and 100, with over 90 being very good. And for Nottinghamshire, the average BCI score for all of our bridge elements is 91. So you, you can see we're in the very good bracket. The final group of assets I wanted to discuss were, were street lights. Uh, there's a, a lot of them. We've got um, 94,000 of them in Nottinghamshire approximately. And over the years, we've had a couple of strategies which have included the, the bulk clean and change of light bulbs, which is doing them in a systematic fa uh, fashion or burning them to extinction and, and replacing them as and when they went out. But ultimately, neither of those strategies um, really was giving us what we wanted. Um, and, but we have achieved that with the introduction of LEDs. So you know, currently, there's about 75% of the county council street lights have been, been changed to LEDs. And these LEDs have considerable advantages. They're 60% more efficient than conventional lanterns, so that gives us substantial savings on both CO2 and electricity. Uh, the degree of savings we'll get for each bulb will depend upon the, you know, the power of the bulb and the location it's in, but to give you a, an idea, for a, a residential street light, a, a conventional bulb would have cost between £25 and £30 a year in electricity, but for an LED it's only £5 to £8 a year. Uh, and because they last much longer and they can continue in service for up to 25 years, uh, we have fewer street lighting outages and officers in VIA have reported uh, a notable reduction in street lighting faults since we've begun the programme of changing over to LEDs. Um, what we're also doing is um, we're, we're putting new installations in, we're combining the LEDs with street lighting columns. So these are thicker gauge columns that are more resistant to, um, to, to corrosion and they can expect to have a 50-year life expectancy. So you can see by combining the LEDs and these new specifications of street lighting columns, we can have an asset which will remain in service for, for decades and will considerably reduce both our maintenance and running costs. So finally, you know, whereabouts are we going? Well, we've, we've spoken about preventative maintenance and ICT solutions. 
Um, there's reporter pothole, which you can do online. There's social media. But there's other things we're looking to do as well in conjunction with VIA. So one of the things that we're, we're currently looking at is the in situ recycling of, um, of road arisings where we've had to plane roads up for resurfacing or reconstructing, reconstruction, and where we've identified tar contamination. Now tar, it's a, a carcinogenic, um, and if we were to try and get rid of it to a specialist site, it would typically cost us over 70 pounds a tonne or we'd need to take it off site and have it processed and then reuse it. And, and if we were to do that, there'd be costs, vehicle movements and energy consumption associated with it. So if we can reuse that material on site and treat it on site, we can have substantial costs, both environmentally and in the cost of the scheme. Uh, other things we're looking to trial are smaller <coughs> hot boxes. So, you know, this, this vehicle you can see in the centre there, it's quite a large hot box. It may be difficult to get into some smaller locations, but if we've got a smaller hot box, it makes it easier to get down cul-de-sacs and streets of that nature. We're also experimenting with mobile asphalt mixers, and these are small, well, I suppose, small concrete mix, mixer sorts of things where you can just mix up the amount of road servicing materials you need at any one time. And also, electronically powered uh, welfare units. So they don't need a generator for generating heat and power for the welfare unit. It's it's just it's just an electric, a, a battery. So thank you very much for listening and I'll hand you back to the chair. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um... My computer decided it was going to update, so I've just stopped it. Um, thank you very much, Ian and uh, Martin. Um, some of this presentation was um, part of a presentation that was done for the committee back in 2017. Um, it has obviously been enhanced because we've moved forward in that time. And I thank uh, officers for their help and support in looking at new technologies. And there are quite a few things coming on the horizon. So hopefully, if they all work or are successful as we look at them, we can all incorporate some of these going forward. Is there anything you want to add, Councillor Wheeler, just before I go to ask questions to um, the two presenters from our members on the committee? Thank you, John, much appreciated. Thank you, as you've just said, to both uh, Mars and Annie Ian for a very helpful presentation, an excellent presentation. It's a presentation which my committee has seen, and that's why it's coming to you, John. Very appropriate that when Ian Patrick talks about patching. Your mum was on that, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> That's your job for life. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that one before, Ian. Um, uh, what I would say is it's all very well seeing slides that Ian's put up on screen today. Great. What I've actually seen it happen on the road, the patching that Ian's referred to, one of my roads in my bridge. It is, I would, I, would, I would say to every member listening here today, those are not listening today, talk to officers, talk to people like Ian. Uh, talk to your local district managers if there are issues within your division which could benefit from remedial treatment rather than say we want the whole road resurfaced cost an absolute fortune it's something which officers will be only too happy to look at i know i, I can speak from personal experience they're not miracle workers they can't all identify all the roads all themselves they need us to help them to do their job i would strongly urge and, and more than urge i would ask please Get in touch with officers, talk to them, work with them. And if you do that, you find that you really find it. You'll get you'll get this part of the solution you're looking for. They're extremely helpful, very calm. They are not just saying because they happen to be in front of me today. They know what they know my views on this anyway. So thank you, John. I really appreciate to, to, um, that you give me the chance to come back on this. And um, well, as I said, the presentations are very good. It will be circulated, I understand, electronically to everyone here today. And if anyone here today also wants it, I'm sure Martin can organise that as well. Really appreciate being able to speak again, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wheeler. Um, the recommendation is on page 23 in the pack, and it recommends that the proposals contained in paragraph six to eight above, being the findings and recommendation of the Communities and Place Review and Development Committee, are endorsed by the Communities and Place Committee. So I thank you, Gordon, uh, for the work that your committee carried out. And um, it was good to see the presentation. Presentation. I've got a few hands up. Um, first one was Councillor Hollis. Thank you, Councillor Hollis. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Firstly, thank you to uh, Councillor Wheeler, Ian, and Martin uh, as well for that report and also the findings. And 
Uh, I know Councillor Wheeler um, has put a lot of work into this. Councillor Martin tells me that um, you're on his case all the time and they've been working very closely with all committee members uh, on your committee. So I really thank you for that um, and, and the way you've led the officers through it. Um, based on the presentation I've seen and from Councillor Martin's feedback to me, it's clear to me that um, we see things very similar, actually, and, and you um, are working in the right direction as far as I can see. My, I'd probably say critical points, um, constructive criticism, I hope you take it as that, um, really picking up on the comments you just finally made there, Councillor Wheeler, with regards to, firstly, reporting stuff, and I have two comments to make on that. My concern is when I've reported things, or when my residents and neighbours have reported things in the past, we get um, a van come out, a bag of Viafix shoved in, stamped on with the feet, rolled over with the van, and then two weeks later the same hold, hold bell. Uh, we often see a bit of a lack of communication, which I know is touched on in your report. So I think the faith's not there anymore. The trust's been lost, and, I, and I'd hope we'd work on that. And I think actually we've got ground to make up. Because actually, I think everything you've said was exactly right. And the point you made was, it's how it affects the road, which will be counted, not the talk. And that's um, something that I'm, I welcome. But So that's one point. And the second point to make, um, Chairman and Councillor Weaver, would be the reporting mechanism. And I, I've been on this council nearly a decade. Um, and only in the last year has it changed where members, council members, uh, have been asked to take an isolated approach to their own divisions. Um, I'm the deputy leader of Ashfield, but I care about all of Nottinghamshire. Um, and if I'm driving through Nottinghamshire and I see a problem, I'd like to report it, whether I'm in Councillor Dobson's area, Bolsover, Bassett Law, Bushcliff. I, I feel it's our duty as public officials to make sure we're updating the council. Now I'm told that we cannot do that. Um, there's not only been a number of data breaches, uh, where, for example, my emails, personal emails sent to council officers have been forwarded with personal information from residents to um, other council members. But the main point there is, is if a member of the public can report something, why can't council members? Uh, and I'm sure we'd all feel the same that our duties to Nottinghamshire, not just the areas that we represent. And I've always understood the process to be that the, the member for that area would get comp Call them copied into the reply. Of course, that's right. If any member of the public or councillor reports something, the reply should be sent to the member as well to keep them informed. But that process seemingly changed. The directive was sent from the county council to VIA, I believe from Mr Derek Hickton only last year, informing them of the change. So I'd hope you look into that, um, Councillor Wheeler, as part of this review, uh, and Councillor Cotty, because I, I certainly feel it, it's a, a fundamental change that I think has been kind of brushed under the carpet. But then drawing my comments as well to the report, um, in paragraph seven, uh, at the top of page two, it states that Via East Midlands will continue to improve how it communicates the County Council's highway asset management practices. This will include the production of a number of short videos that will be available online. I would honestly argue that communication um, has been via East Midlands' as biggest problem. We all know how important communication is. What we have seen, however, is a decrease in the standard of works. There's no point pretending this isn't the issue. The most commonly run stories about our council roads have sadly been uh, the poor standard of the roads and footpaths. The issue, the, then obviously, the, with the continued usage of Viafix, um, the general standard of the roads has decreased. Um, and, I, and I think on top of that, as I previously said, Mr Chairman, the, the communications of these works has been the problem. But I'll, that's my comments. I'm genuinely meant as constructive criticism, but I, I really welcome the fact that not only are the communications going to be improved, but also the ethos, I think, led by Councillor Wheeler, has actually been excellent. Uh, and I really hope that ethos actually be, translates into the practical outcomes that we all want. But overall, Mr Chairman, I welcome the report and, and I thank you for allowing me the time to share my comments. Thanks for your comments, Councillor Hollis. Uh, you can report any incident anywhere. You certainly can with your technology as well, because you can use the MyNots app, 
and put that in and it will get reported and responded to. Mr Chairman, that, that's not actually the case. And the, the, the head of Virus Midlands sent me an email to state that wasn't the case. And, and actually, on I was well, also under your authority that that wasn't allowed. So I'll send you that email. I, I've had noth nothing to do with anything to do with that, uh, okay. Councillor Hollis. Okay. So yeah, you could send sure. me the email. But I will, I will. And, and yeah, I'll yeah, thank you. Mr Hickton about that as well, because his email was the one yeah. that changed the directive. Thank you. Well, it's not, not come from me anyway. So anybody can report anything. If you see it, it's responsibility to report it. So um, nobody else has an accident or an issue or a problem. And also, we will have to continue using Viafix because of what we've inherited. So if we don't and somebody has an accident, we are then legal for, legally required to pay compensation on that claim if there is a compensation claim. So I'll move on to um, just seeing who is. Uh, Councillor Guilfoyle, please. And then Councillor Greaves. You're just on mute, Councillor. Sorry about that. Yep. Is this a new way of working that you're proposing, or has this been in since 2017? Because that 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 would be my first one. Because clearly, um, any engineer will tell you that preventive plan maintenance is the best way forward. Always has been, uh, and using new technology uh, to to uh, to do that. Um, and I, and I don't disagree with all the science that's been put out there by Ian and, and Martin. You know, I've look, looked at that and, and, and clearly, you know, you can you can see that. But over the last four years, we've seen uh, probably some of the most biggest investment that POTS has had from central government uh, and locally, the additional 20 million that, that the council's put in for, for roads uh, in Nottinghamshire. Yet we are still you know, the worst in the country, uh, in, in the top 10, you know, we are still the worst in the country. And, and, you know, from my, well, it gets me the fact that we took money from other projects, look as, such as supported care and, and various other things to supplement the budget as well. Um, number of issues. One is obviously, uh, I suppose it was much to Tom's annoyance when he saw the list of, uh, the proportion of roads in the county, uh, and uh, I'll have to chuckle because I'm not now the deputy leader of uh, Bassett Law District Council, but I used to be, you know. But thought to get that in because that just matched what Tom says. But now, just as it, the issue for me is, is uh, Bassett Law has got the most roads. It would be good to see what proportion of spend uh, is is on those particular roads. It with the um, sort of also. A, a, a chart that says actually what's the condition of those roads because as a member then that would give me some insight to where we should be spending the money anyway and there wouldn't be an argument because we've got the science the science is there that tells us what the roads are like so I would have hoped that you could have come around and said that uh, here is Bassett Law there's x thousand miles and out of those categories the A, B and C um, in, in Bassett Law um, in the category A a certain percentage is at this and we need to be uh, dealing with this. And that would, would give me an idea of, of what, what we were doing in, in Bassett Law. Also, uh, it would be good to see um, a timescale for this. There's no there's no sort of timescale mentioned. You know, how long will it take us to bring this, this up? And I know you've mentioned that before in previous presentations about how long it will take with the X amount of money being spent. Um, uh, to, to bring it up, but it would be good to see to see that time scale. Um, the other issue that I've got in particular is about micro, uh, micro asphalting and surface dressing that's been done. I, it's poor. The stuff that's been done, and I, you know, and I can, I've only got to walk out my front door, and I will say that um, it was only done less than 18 months ago, and uh, the road is now holding water again because clearly what they did. Um, they just surface brushed the top and just slammed some uh, surface dressing on it right across all around the estate, not just here, but right across the estate. And I had to bring the officers out at the time. Uh, and basically, when I brought the officers out, uh, the, the person representative, representative who, who came out and did it kept saying, oh, well, it's because of this. And by the time I'd got to the third 
street where I was showing them, and it, I just thought, I tell you what, it's, um, we're wasting each other's time. Because basically, you're, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to change your mind. But actually, this isn't a good job. And I would say if you went around those, some of those streets now, you could, re, you know, they, they're ready for resurfacing again. And I know other people have had similar problems with it. So I'm not convinced that uh, that is, in some respects, the best way, way to go forward. Um, I also the the issue on 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 uh, the presentation the little bit we put on on street lighting which again you know I mean we all welcome the fact that we're we're going to be saving money and and we can reinvest that in other areas um, but the issue of we're lighting dim I thought the policy on on dimming lights had actually been rescinded that we weren't doing that anymore not just on for the cases of um, areas where crime was but specifically because it was such a problem for people um, and I would hate that we have a, 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 a blanket approach uh, not just in high crime areas because at the end of the day all you do is if you turn them off which is what happened in some areas at that particular time when they were switched off it created an high crime area because burglar bill went oh well I'll go there because nobody can see me so you know for me I, I would hope that we, we wouldn't go on that in all um, I understand the science. I understand uh, where you're coming from, but I, I, I just think it's it's going to be a, a very difficult time for the public out there to accept. And I'll give you an instance that even your colleagues are not on on message with it. Um, the 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 local person who's standing for election around here from the conservative was put in a put it on his Facebook page. Um, a particular street near me, which I've asked for it to be redone, and it's always a problem. Now, I've asked for it to be reserviced uh, over a year, 18 months ago, and also, but it, it keeps just getting patched. Um, and he, he's, you know, on his Facebook page criticising the fact that the roads aren't good and nobody's doing anything about it. And I thought, well, you ought to be having a word with your colleagues because it's them that are, are sort of managing the situation. You know, as a councillor, I do my job, I believe, very well in reporting. Uh, problems. Um, it, it's getting getting them done that's the issue. Uh, and I, I'm not being critical of offices in any way, shape, or form. I know the constraints that they have had, but actually, financially, we have had more money invested in roads because that has been your linchpin of the election um, to to spend more money on roads rather than some of the other areas. And and to be honest. I would say, and I'm sure, you know, we've failed miserably. So I think, you know, we need to be looking at this system. It, it, uh, and I, as I say, understand the science, but in practical terms, it's not working. Well, I will come back to you on that, Glenn, because you've been selective in some of your comments that you've made. The, the new street lighting isn't being dimmed. It's uh, following on from where you started the process, which was the right thing to do, and we've continued it forward. So those lights are on and they're LED. Chairman, and not if you, I'm, all I'm saying, if you look at the present chasing though, Chairman, what it said yeah. is that lighting in areas will, is, be. is being dimmed Reduced. from 10, to, 10 till 7 in the morning, hmm? except in areas and where, of eye crime. I'm not looking for a debate, Glenn. Um, right. I know that you've made your comments, but the police will tell you how much crime happened in areas that were dimmed or switched off. And it was no more than they would normally have in their figures. So that's not quite true. This presentation wasn't the same four years ago. It was the start of it because that's what we've been doing all the way, all the way through. We've always said that we're not doing the worst first because if we did, all the roads would be first, uh, worst because of what we've inherited over 40 years. It doesn't just happen in two or three years. And if you think it has, then I'm sorry, you don't understand the road network. I mean, Councillor Greaves, I know I'm, I'm waiting to hear what he's got to say because he's the man that brought in Viafix. He's the one that brought it in. But if we don't use Viafix with the condition of the roads we've got now, we'll have people having accidents in them. And Viafix is quite good in most locations and most ways. So what else have we got to put in? Nobody's told me. Nobody, all, all people have said is, oh, let's do proper repairs. Find me the money then. And also when you say about um, 
taking away from investments in accommodation at the start of our administration, you know that's not true. You, you want to say it because there's an election coming. So I'll move on because we've spent an hour and a half, uh, three quarters of an hour on this. So we're going to have to move on in a few minutes. But I'll let Councillor Greaves has got his hand up. But thank you for your comments. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, of course I've got something to say because I'm going to say, where's all the money gone? We've been, we've been allocated the worst roads in Britain. And that's a damning indictment on your administration. The worst roads in Britain. So, you know, end of the day, you've gone on cheap, gone on the cheap, microchipping, surface dressing. I want to ask a question, what's the lifespan of surface dressing? Because I can tell you now that I can go to a road just down here, half a mile away from me that was done eight months ago, and it's pothole ridden already. And they're having to come and fix uh, them potholes. And while we're on about potholes, a hundred million you spent on a pothole machine with a 79% failure rate. Where on earth is that gone? On all that array of machinery that Martin Blessing has put on, put on this page just now in the presentation, not one of that million pound machine that everybody hailed as a great success with a 79% failure rate Nobody's seen it. Nobody in Bassett Law seen it, other than in a yard somewhere, it's never been seen. And I'm going to suggest that it's in a, it's in a compound somewhere, rusting away. I can see what we are going to be inherited in, after the election. We're going, to, <laughs> we're going to be inheriting an absolute catastrophe of our well, own system. Thank you, Councillor Greaves, because we've in, in, uh, inherited a, a nightmare from the I last 40 years. That, I haven't oh. finished that. I never interrupted I, you. I never I, interrupted you, Chairman. But I've got to say... I apologise, Councillor Greaves. If you could let me, if you could let me carry on with me questioning, please. Uh, paragraph 6, third bullet point, at the top of the page, uh, on page 22, relative proportion of highways revenue capital funding available to undertake repairs and maintenance. What does this say to pa young uh, parishes, small villages? If the pathways are not used as much as what you think they should be used, they're going to get abandoned. As we all know, I've got four parishes, and then the four parishes that I've got, there's little pathways there that get overrun with weeds and moss. Does this mean that they're going to be lost forever because it's going to cost too much to reinstate them? Because that's what it reads here to me. It reads that it's going to be forgotten about, abandoned. And that's what's going to happen. And now I'm going to say, it's going to set alarm bells ringing to all, all parishes and small villages that they will be losing their pathways because if they're not used as much as, oh, I don't know, says they're not being used, they're going to get abandoned and they're going to get left. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Greaves. Um, just to point you right, it's not £100 million for the machine, by the way, which is what you said at the beginning. And also the fact is that if you think a road deteriorates in a year, you're t totally mistaken. It's your previous administrations for the 28 years you were in control that you didn't spend the money in the right areas. That's why they're doing what they're doing. And the same with footpaths. What did you do on footpaths? Well, I'm not going to sling the mud, but um, I'll leave you with it. And I'm sure that the officers might answer the, you know, the odd question. I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Lawson. You want to speak, Councillor Lawson? Your hand was there, but and then I'm I can't. It's obviously silly season. Um, the Labour Party have got complete and utter selective um, amnesia. <clears throat> this administration has put more money into highways maintenance than any other administration 
since I've been a councillor, and I think uh, for, for the last 40 or, or 50 years, because of what we inherited. A complete and utter mess, Kevin. A complete and utter mess, both in my communities. And if you, you're talking about lost footways, I can name you half a dozen lost footways that were lost way into your administration that we're having to reintroduce. So none of your political claptrap. It doesn't wear with us and it doesn't wear with the public neither. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Lawton. I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Dobson if she'd like to say a few words and, um, and then I'll ask uh, Martin and Ian if there are any non-political comments they wish to make. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Well, I'd like to stick to the report, if you don't mind, on page 21, under recommendations with footway and cycle way maintenance, bearing in mind since the COVID appeared, a lot more people are doing cycling. So I recommend I uh, approve and appreciate what Gordon Wheeler's uh, review team, unfortunately, I couldn't attend that particular meeting. But I do like the second bullet point where it says, when designing any future cycleways, could we have some more money into uh, that area? And then perhaps the small cycle routes that we have, or walking routes, that I have in 14 villages that I represent, uh, and um, small areas, uh, I think that would help tremendously if we could do it a little bit more often. Because of the dreadful weather we've been having, Chairman, we've had huge amounts of weeds and different things growing and grass onto these small footpaths much quicker than they used to do. So I think that needs, in your review, gentlemen, and if there's a lady involved in your department, can you say to her as well, would you please consider that seriously? Um, you've done at the top uh, the relative proportion of highways revenue and capital funding available to undertake repairs to footways and cycles. I want you to review that. I'm constantly, and at the same time, Chairman, it's no good just reviewing if we can put more funding into that area, but we've also got to consider the amount of funding that's in drainage, because without drainage and non-water going onto these footpaths, it, it's going to be a waste of money again, because no sooner as you've got them on your footpath, you've got your footpath done, if we're going to continue to have the amount of rain that we do have, then we're going to lose them again just as quickly. Um, I've spoken to Doug Coots um, personally. I ring him up and have conversations with him. And to be fair, whether you like it or not, any of you, he listens to me and he gives me some good responses back so I can take it to the um, relevant parish councils. But what I would ask, Chairman, is once this report is done and review is done, could I ask whether I'm with you or not? Could I ask this particular report is then presented and sent to all the parish councils and town councils we've got in the county so they are aware? Because Tom is right, we do get harangued by the public. Glyn is right, we do get harangued by the public. But as I tell them, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of dreadful sit weather conditions we're in the middle of all sorts of things that we've never had before forget who spent what when and haven't i'm talking about what's happening now and it's not good so i need for me and i think for all of you you need to be able to explain exactly what's going on so but thank you for the presentation ian are you listening to me? You, Martin, you and I have conversations, so I'm happy with that. I'd just like you to remind Ian to have a conversation with me on occasions, please. I always listen to you, Councillor Dobson. You know that. Yes, I'm sure you do. Thank <laughs> you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Dobson. Um, Martin and Ian, is there anything you want to, to come back on or you? Um, I, I could touch on uh, certainly a couple of points that Councillor Guilfoyle and Councillor Hollis mentioned there about the um, the, the passion. Certainly, Councillor Guilfoyle talked about the the science and it, you know, it, it sounding like it wasn't new, and he's and he's correct. You know, putting a patch of whatever size in a road is not particularly new of itself. But what's improving 
just lately when I talked in the presentation about data and the, and the processes we have for identifying those locations for that patching. So we have um, we have technical survey data which gives us an appreciation of the whole county. And we also have inspectors out there who, whose primary function is for safety, looking for potholes and such like, and that leads on to via fix repairs. And there's there's talk around that, of course, but also the inspectors are also flagging up these sites for the preventive maintenance and the larger scale patching so that hopefully then we get we get the teams in, we can plan it properly, we can dial in the economies of scale where, where possible. And that means the next time the inspector goes around, those defects aren't there. And I appreciate as well with the micro asphalt, it's not perfect in all areas. Its lifespan um, can depend on the hierarchy of the road, the usage can depend on the weather, it, when it went down and all these and the materials involved and all these variable factors. But it, what it does is, I mean, any non-invasive treatment like addressing is, is, is a more repetitive cycle anyway. So, for example, for one resurfacing scheme, we can we can hold, if you like, four or half a dozen sites using micro asphalt so we can at least concentrate on the most important sites where there are a thousand pothole repairs and those are prioritized based on the amount of impact they're already having on reactive maintenance budgets for example or the amount of um, noise there is from local residents and the amount of inquiries and, and, and you know if it's already a black hole then we prioritize those first so the technology itself isn't necessarily new bits of it are in having the hot box and such like but it's the it's the processes we have in place for identifying these sites and we're, we're using more technology now more than more than we ever have to try and get us to a place where uh, and this touches again on something councillor hollis said about the, the community education side where we'd like to get to a world where we could actually um communicate with councillors where we believe based on our objective engineering data where we believe the most highest priority site or where we believe the priorities are even even down at ward level if possible and then we can have those conversations with individual councillors then about where to go first and what to do um what the, what the best process will be after that so it's it's it, it does come down to risk and priorities and um, whether it's a preventative treatment or a restorative treatment where you're having to dig the road up it's all about you know which which road should be first and unfortunately we are in a world where if you're working on site a someone will be complaining about site b and that's that's just the reality we can't we can't escape that but the reason we're doing site a we we, we like to believe that the objective data we use is valid for why why we go to site a and not site b thanks ian thank you very much um also uh, i'll just come back to councillor greaves um I would admit that when we first got the um, piece of equipment you were referring to, um, we had to train people and we had to um, work out on how we ran it and the mixture that went into it, although we were given guidelines on that, but it is out there and it is working across the county and um, it is doing a good job. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll supply you with the information of where it's been because it's recorded every place it goes to and that's right across the county. So thank you, Martin and Ian, for the presentation. Um, I hope, uh, Councillor Wheeler, it was as exciting and uh, entertaining in your uh, your committee. Um, but I'm going to have to move to the vote because we've had over an hour and it's obviously of great interest to everybody. So it's a shame when uh, uh, we, we could have probably done a seminar on it, but uh, there we go. So I'm, I am going to move to the vote. So thank you, everyone, for your input. So. Are there any votes against the recommendation? Any abstentions? This, I can see two, three. Can you get that, Noel? You. I've got one, two, three, four. Four. Okay. Do we have a recorded vote, Chairman? Please. I have to ask the clerk. Second that. Uh, yes. Bear with. Yes, that that's absolutely fine. I can I can and, call out. And the seconder. Who was the seconder? I, uh, Councillor Cream was seconded. Thank you, Councillor Cream. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. That was. I heard that. Right. Okay. Um. Right. We'll, we'll call for um that that vote. Um. So I will call upon committee members in alphabetical order to indicate whether they are for, against or abstaining in respect of uh, the recommendations. So, uh, Councillor Pauline Allen. Abstain. 
Thank you. Councillor Cotty for Councillor Creamer. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Greaves. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Guilfoyle. Abstain. Hang on. <laughs> Councillor yeah. Handley. Four. Okay. Councillor Hollis. Four. Okay. Councillor Hopewell. Four. Four. Councillor Lawton. Four. Okay. Councillor Ogle. Four. Thanks, Councillor. And Councillor Rostens. Four. Four. Thanks. Just bear with me. So we have seven votes for, four votes abstaining and none against. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. We'll move on to the next item, which is highways, trees, verge, maintenance and wildfire planting. And um, I will move the recommendation on page 27 of the pack. I would be happy for a seconder. Happy to second that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And this again has gone through the Communities and Place Review Committee and Development Committee. And this is to be endorsed by the Communities and Place Committee. Again, Councillor Wheeler, do you want to say something now or do you want to come in at the end? Which would you prefer or both? With your permission, John, rather than have two bites of the same cherry, can I come in afterwards, please? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to keep it a bit shorter if people, members could do it because we spent over an hour on the last subject and I'm not saying these aren't important. They are. But um, I would, am I going to Martin Kanafin? Thank you, Martin. You, you're muted, Martin. Oh, sorry. Um, the, rec <laughs> the recommendations contained in this report all relate to the forthcoming 2020-21 Highways Environmental Maintenance Programme. The, the report re tries to reflect members' wishes to promote species diversity, pollinators and the wider green agenda, but at the same time it recognises the constraints associated with highway budget and the, the County Council's statutory duty to keep the highway safe. We do understand that other organisations have a considerable expertise in these matters, and so we did undertake consultation with representatives of uh, Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust while we were working on the recommendations. Uh, finally, uh, we also understand that environmental, environmental maintenance and specifically verge maintenance can generate some very strong and often conflicting views amongst members of the public. So we're committed to working with members and the parish councillors to ensure that their views are taken into account before we make any changes. Uh, and so to conclude, I'd, I'd just like to refer members to the recommendations which start off at the bottom of page one of the report and carry on to pages two and three. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Martin. Um, I will go to speakers in a moment. I would appreciate, I'm not trying to stop you talking, as you know, I don't normally do that. Um, but if you could get to the questions, I would be appreciative to move the meeting on, please. So, Councillor Hollis and Councillor Greaves, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for presenting the report and also for Martin's comments there. And, and I think, broadly speaking, I welcome, I understand there's budgetary constrictions, as, as you mentioned in paragraph five and six. Uh, I was intrigued by the communication you'd had with the Woodlands Trust. I wondered if you could go into more, more detail there and what their comments were. Um, and obviously, members will note that uh, 4th of November last year, the, the government launched a uh, a £50 million scheme to help boost tree planting uh, and planting rates across the country. Uh, this was largely due to the fight against climate change. Uh, and I wondered if we put in any bids into that scheme as part of this process as well, almost a two for one deal. Thank you. Councillor Greaves, I'll go through Martin if you're okay and then okay. come back. Okay, yep. yeah. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, welcome to this report. And uh, I'm glad uh, it's finally uh, uh, going to be brought forward. It's spent uh, a lot of years in uh, what we've got here, abeyance uh, over the years, which is a shame, really, because uh, it is such a it is a, such a good initiative. Not not the cheapest, Sorry. not the cheapest by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, regarding tree planting, uh, regarding tree planting, are we going to give um, uh, priorities to uh, in flood areas for flood mitigation. 
because as we know, trees can take a, up a lot of water. An average uh, oak tree can take up 50 litres a day. Uh, so are we going to be uh, tree planting in locations uh, to help with flooding mitigations? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Greaves. That on off button's not working again. Uh, Councillor Creamer, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Again, and then Councillor welcome... Guilfoyle, please, after that. Thank you, Chair. Again, wel welcome the report. Just a little bit disappointed in one thing. We discussed at several meetings about bees, etc. And it would have seemed an ideal opportunity to actually incorporate uh, free corridors, etc. Given the restraints on money, etc. I just wondered if any consideration had been given while this plan was created to actually the protection of bees. Thank you, Chip. Thanks, Lim. Thank you, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the debate on the other thing. I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's thank fine. you very much for the for the debate. J just on this, I, I, I do welcome the report, and I understand the issue about it being in abeyance. But it, it still, to me, from previously, we don't seem to be really anywhere further forward with it. And that that's the you know even on the report, you know. I, I've not looked back and I was going to do, but if I look back, I would have thought, well, this is similar to the one that we had previously. It's a similar report. Uh, from me, one of the things that it doesn't do, it does talk about budget constraints. And although it identifies the uh, three quarters of a million that we spend on trees, which is a, an enormous amount of money, um, it doesn't sort of quantify or give us an indication of um, what the costs uh, would be to do these projects and I know that uh, when we were have our as, as you know you know when we have our briefing like you do you know we, we sort of uh, asked Derek about this and Derek was saying that in some cases it costs more uh, to do this than what it would if we we left it um, as as we normally do and just do the two or three cuts um, uh, per year um, but it, it would be interesting to see what, uh, some sort of budget and then that would be able to be put against what we can actually do and and you know it you know rather than as you say go for a blanket approach or whatever else because it is controversial and it do, you know and there are issues and i've i i know that i've got an area in my patch where it it, it works i also know there's areas where people are against it because they don't like to see they like to see it nice and kept and everything else so i know the controversy over the issue but I think it would be good if at least we could sort of say, well, to do X would cost Y. And I think that then, you know, gives members the opportunity then to make a decision on, on you know, the issue. Because clearly at the moment, it's just saying, well, we're, gonna, we're going out for talks, which I thought we were doing anyway. And we're going to identify some areas, which I, again, I thought we'd, that was what we were doing. And, and clearly in reality for me as i say it's just uh, acknowledging where we were six or when the last report came there is part of that in it glenn i think it's because of all the flooding and uh, yeah. highway issues and things that we've had so it has created a, a slowdown on some of the other things i accept what you're saying um uh, i'm going to go to derek on the trees if that's okay and i'll come shall i come back to you afterwards gordon is that okay oh have we got jim I can't see. Uh, fine, I think Chair, Jim spoke. You whenever, you, whenever you want me to, that's fine. Yeah, I've, I've put my question in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll go. I'll go to Derek first, then, if that's okay. It might clarify some of the comments. Thank you, Chairman. And just to pick up um, on the questions from Councillor Hollis and Councillor Greaves around um, uh, tree planting, I think the, the, the short answer is um, that the majority of the trees that um, the County Council has responsibility for managing actually are, are not highway trees, but uh, trees that sit on our green estate where we've got over 90 sites um, around the county um, uh, in, in uh, you know locations in every district. Uh, and Councillor Wheeler's um, uh, subcommittee is currently considering um, the, the role and the future of, of the council's um, green estate and, and consider that at a meeting last week. And as part of that um, work and our strategic approach to uh, the, uh, effective management of the green estate, one of the things we are doing is looking to source um, external funding um, for tree planting um, initiatives uh, in appropriate locations. Um, uh, the government funding is really welcome um, to that extent uh, and we're absolutely in the process of making um, uh, a range of applications to support 
um, uh, tree planting for all the environmental reasons that members have identified. Um, uh, Councillor Greaves, you asked um, around kind of the, the potential benefit of tree planting from a flood mitigation um, perspective. That's absolutely um, the case and it's certainly part of the uh, thinking uh, of our flood risk management colleagues as we consider uh, a, a variety of mitigation schemes um, uh, up and down the county. Obviously it doesn't work in uh, every circumstance and in every location and of course uh, quite often the benefits of tree planting can be slow to accrue, they're not immediate um, benefits. Uh, you mentioned um, oak trees for example and uh, that's absolutely the case but of course they take a long while to reach um, maturity and so on. So um, it's absolutely part of the mix um, um, but um, it's part of that um, long-term solution that we're looking to um, introduce in a number of locations. Uh, 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 and in the meantime, we'll also need to introduce short and medium-term um, solutions around flood risk. Thank you, Derek. Martin, is there any issues there you wanted to come back on? Then I'll go to Councillor Wheeler just to sum up afterwards. Thank you. Yes, just to um, confirm the, the information we got from the Wildlife Trust, their recommendation was to to go with the, uh, the one cut a year with the arisings being uh, either retained on site in heaps or taken off site um, rather than ornamental planting beds uh, and that feeds very much into the discussion on bee corridors as well that was something that they suggested would be the most appropriate way to encourage pollinators uh, also with um, with the bee corridors we are limited into what, what we can do with the resources that are available to us. We would, it's obviously something we would like to pursue, but with the resources available, you know, we, we're constrained with, with what we can actually achieve. Uh, and finally, regarding the, uh, the, the schedule of what we can do and how much it costs, well, these are things that we'll be able to report back as and when we've worked the schemes up. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you. I can see a hand appearing from Councillor Dobson. If, I would appreciate you. Short and sweet, please, uh, Maureen. I will thank be you. short and sweet. Thank, thank you. you, Chairman, very much appreciate. Uh, I've spoken to Martin about this. I have a village that wants to do some wildlife, uh, wildflower planting. So could I ha add in the recommendation, or would you add in the recommendation, that you go out to parishes as, as soon as possible, please? Happy to do that. Uh, I'm quite happy to go out to the parishes, Maureen, but I'd rather not change the recommendation if that's all right. I'll give you my word that I would do that, if that's OK, and for that's the rest fine. of the people. That's fine. That's you fine. can hold me to it. OK, okay I will do. I will do. OK, I'll pass over to Councillor Wheeler, who'd like to just finish off before we take the vote. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, paragraph 10, and uh, Derek Hickton already mentioned this, but the Green Estate, you've got recommendations coming to your committee in the fullness of time. Um, not a lot to add to what's already been said. It's a very helpful discussion, actually. Apart from paragraph 18, I know we've already had the details on what on the NRV scheme a while back. I think it would be very helpful, particularly as Maureen has just said uh, about parishes being notified. If we can refresh, uh, if that's not too much trouble for Martin, to refresh councillors as to what um, where the locations are as agreed with the Nottingham Wildlife Trust. We, we lose track of these things after a while, we're not careful. So if it's not too much work, Martin, for you and your team, uh, subject, to the, subject to the views of the chairman, I think that would be very helpful. OK, thank you, Gordon. I'm happy with that. You OK with that, Martin? You can give me a nod. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. okay. yeah thank you. OK. OK, thank you for your input, everyone. Um, I'll now move to the vote. And uh, are there any votes against the recommendation? Any abstentions? It's agreed unanimously. Thank you. And thank you all for your input. We move on to item seven, minerals and waste development scheme update. Um, I would like to formally move the recommendation on page 31 of the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder, please? I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Rostens. Um, I think Sally Gill is with us. Yes, Sally, thank you. Thank you, Chair. The County Council has to prepare a local development scheme uh, for its minerals and waste local plans, which essentially sets out the timetable and the resources needed to prepare these two local plans. The last time we refreshed and reviewed the uh, uh, LDS was uh, in March 2019. Unfortunately, um, last year, our, because of COVID and our timetable went um, 
slightly awry. So we're bringing a refreshed timetable for the preparation of those plans back to, to yourselves. And it is something that we, we need to have members approval. So um, the appendix sets out the timetable that we're currently working to for the minerals local plan and the waste local plan. And uh, that, that is the programme that we will be trying to follow. And obviously at appropriate stages, taking reports and documents to yourselves for, for consideration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sally. Appreciate that. Um, I can see a question from Councillor Creamer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. The the timetable was actually clarified because the recommendation doesn't make it that clear. It's actually the timetable. So thanks for that. And just uh, will members still be involved in the actual uh, in the create in the final creation of these plans? Will it still be across the board joint jointly? Thank you. That's it. Do you, do you want to come back, Sally? Thank yes, you. yes. So, so certainly, whilst officers will put the documents together, members' approval at all stages of document pre preparation is very important because uh, the, plan is, the plans are for, for Nottinghamshire and uh, members' views are a huge uh, part of, of that. So where appropriate, we do have members' working groups and uh, they tend to be, uh, well, they are cross-party cross working groups because it's important. The plan, these plans are for Nottinghamshire, they're not for uh, a particular part of Nottinghamshire, they're, they're, for, they're for everyone. So cross-party uh, working groups looking at these and helping develop these documents is very important. Thank you, Sally. Any other questions? Councillor Rostens, do you want to come in? Are you OK? No, no, nothing to add. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, team. Thank you. OK, we'll move to the vote then. Um, are there any votes against? Any abstentions? OK, then it's agreed unanimously. Thank you again. So item eight is the Nottinghamshire con concessionary travel scheme. Uh, I formally recommend that move the recommendations on page 50 of the agenda pack. Do I have a seconder, please? Yep, happy to second them. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to invite Pete Matheson to introduce the report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a report that's brought um, every year um, to committee following the statutory concessionary uh, fair scheme notice published at the beginning of December, uh, which informs um, operators of the county will have a concessionary scheme for 21-22. This report is, is seeking approval for the publication of the final screen, screen uh, statutory notice on the um, 3rd of March and outlines the uh, total funding that's available uh, pending for council approval in February. Uh, the continuation of the discretionary elements of the scheme um, for the tram, the companions and section 19 mini minibus elements and looks for the delegated um, power to the uh, service director to make the um, Come on, final financial oh. arrangements um, later in the um, in the year in March. The report also sort of details the sort of current arrangements during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how we're paying um, concessions at pre-COVID levels. Um, despite the fact that the passenger numbers obviously are much lower, um, at 25 to 35%. The report also highlights the government guidance for the concessions payments of 21-22 to, to carry on paying at pre-COVID levels, levels to help the bus sector and help its recovery. And this is the proposed, proposed approach for the County Council in 21-22, and less guidance uh, changes. Uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, in the meantime, we have reduced concessionary payments in year in line with the reduction in service levels uh, during the lockdown restrictions, and, and that's helped us uh, a little bit with the um, current budget, budget challenges that, that we face as a county council. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Pete. Do I have any questions for Pete? Councillor Hollis. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I have a question regards um, paragraph 10. Um, it said that we have a contractual arrangement with the tram operators until the 31st of March 2022. Um, I was wondering, is the County Council minded to continue that arrangement after that date? Just obviously I'm aware that people are taking on work, um, various other commitments that straddle that period. And obviously people need some certainty whether they're going to be able to travel on the current arrangements. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to get in again. Um, any other questions? Pete, do you want to come back on that? Uh, I, 
Sorry? Sorry. Oh, Councillor Lawton. Councillor Lawton. Councillor Lawton. So if I'll, I'll ask Councillor Lawton first. I, I can't see you, Bruce. Sometimes that's good, but there you go. The microphone, please. There you go. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, John. Okay. Uh, Pete, yeah, thanks for this. Um, is with reference to the support for the concessionary uh, travel scheme, we all know that many of, I mean, I've got a major operator in my patch who is really struggling. Um, I've had Econ Dev actually involved to be able to try and help him over the problems in the short term that he has got. Uh, at this present point of time, and any help would be most appreciated. What we've got to recognise is, is that these buses are absolutely essential to many of my rural areas that I represent, my isolated rural areas that maybe only receive one bus service um, a week, but that one bus service a week is a lifeline to some of my residents who um, live in isolated communities. So um, thanks a lot for that. and. Uh, you know, we just need to keep working hard with the bus providers to ensure that they're there when we need them in a few months' time. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I, actually, I can probably come back to Councillor Hollis and if Pete wants to say anything afterwards, he's, he's quite welcome. It, it'll be up to the administration at the time, um, Councillor Hollis. So at the moment, we are, we are carrying on with it. Um, whoever's in power, uh, should we say after May, we'll have that decision to make. So I think that's the answer that um, Pete may come back with, but I don't know. Uh, Pete, is there anything to add? I have nothing to add to that, Councillor. OK, thank you. OK, I can't see any other speakers, so we'll move to the vote then, please. Are there any votes against? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. It's agreed unanimously. Um, we'll now move to item nine, which is the local improvement scheme. And I'm going to Derek Higton, please. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to briefly introduce this um, uh, report, uh, members. Uh, hopefully it's relatively um, self-explanatory. Um, uh, it outlines um, our usual process for uh, seeking applications for the Talented Athletes Fund for 20, 2020 and 2021 uh, and outlines uh, uh, the recommended um, grants to um, uh, 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 75 um, applicants uh, from around the county uh, and Appendix uh, 1 to the report outlines uh, the sports uh, that we are supporting and then also the kind of district breakdown of the individual athletes um, uh, that we're also uh, supporting. I'm sure members will be aware that it's a, a valued scheme uh, by young um, athletes and their families uh, and provides much needed um, support um, to um, our talented Nottinghamshire um, athletes. Um, uh, the report recommends that a committee approve 75 recommended awards to a total of £21,000 and I'm more than happy to take any questions or comments that members may have. Thank you, Derek. Um, I would like to propose the recommendation, which is on page 56 of the agenda pack. I have a seconder, please. Yeah, I'm happy to second that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Handley, Councillor Guilfoyle, and then Councillor Hollis. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. It's just a, a little bit of information, obviously, to, to help members. One of the things... Uh, within the chart. I mean, it's, it's good to see the amounts that are given. There is a, a lot of disparity between um, districts in relation to, to the to the awards. Um, and I think, you know, it would be good if we could get to the bottom of that. I mean, Mansfield, I know, has always been, you know, a really sporty district in some cases, but it, it clearly, you know, there's only three uh, applications being made. And I wondered um, to help members one of the things would be, and I know that we, we, we probably did ask this at the last one, was yeah, I'll pick a, up. A, a breakdown by the, uh, we've got the recommendation and the discipline. It would good probably to see the discipline by district as well, Chairman. And the only reason why I say that is because um, I know, and, and I know Councillor Grieve knows, that there's a, a gymnast uh, club he works on that does a lot of work. And clearly, um, 
you know, I don't know whether they've sort of had a grant. There are also other clubs that we know of. And if, if I can see and you can see in your area that, I don't know, swimming, which was, uh, we were we were leaders in the county on swimming and there seems to be very few swimmers that have actually made a, an application here. Uh, and, in, you know, in particular, we had, you know, uh, <coughs> so with the disability was, a, you know, a very big, issue for us and the number of people that took part in the Olympics, but it does seem that there's only a small number of individuals that have sort of benefited from the scheme. So I think a little bit more detail would help us to help other members of the public to actually apply for this. Um, and, and really that's where I'm coming from. I'm not going to, the scheme's a brilliant scheme and we need it. Uh, we know that, we know that uh, talented athletes, uh, both able and disabled talented athletes don't get enough support. Um, and this does go a long way to help. Just think some of the detail that could help us as members to reach more people um, and, and understand some of it would be a lot better if that if that comes. It's not. I don't think I'm asking for anything that's probably difficult for us to have. Thank okay, you, thank, Thanks, Clem. Councillor Hollis, we'll come back to you with the answer in a minute. No, and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Councillor Gilfoyle. I, I fully agree with what you said, really, and. Uh, obviously, I'm pleased to see 10 athletes from Ashfield District have been successfully awarded the funding. Um, obviously, sport plays a real important role in people's lives, particularly young people's lives. Um, and I'm also pleased to see that the performance element of the funding was extended to 24 months, obviously, due to COVID. So I think that's really positive steps. But exactly how Councillor Guilfoyle said, I think there's no surprise that we've seen a, a, a larger number of applications from Rushcliffe. Uh, and I think that's down to the fact that they've been more successful in getting the message out there um, with regards to the availability of the funding, whether it's through the parish council network, et cetera, and possibly a more uh, engaged uh, population. But often the people that need it most are the people that come to the councillors, people that come to the district council, community groups. Um, and actually those groups need to be aware that this funding's there. So potentially some sort of simple... Um, uh, application form or some sort of simple publication we could put out. Um, I'm aware it's gone out on the County Council website, but I think slightly more than that. I don't know if we can make sure we get a page in the. Um, we'd be happily put it in our district council um, publication to go through the doors of everybody in the district, and I'm sure all the districts would happily do the same. But we need to make sure this is a great scheme, and we need to make sure it's publicised. Is is a simple way of saying it. Um, and I'm very grateful to see um, the numbers in Ashfield supported as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hollis. I can't see in, uh, any more hands. Uh, Councillor Creamer, I uh, just popped yeah. up with. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it showed me hand was up before I put my real hand up. And, and anyway, thank you, Chair. I uh, don't disagree with anything that's been particularly said so, so far, but just a question on the 6% of the disabled athletes. Uh, Literally a question. Do we have a ring fence to mount for disabled athletes? And should we have if we haven't? And uh, are we putting enough effort into actually making sure disabled athletes know about it? So the same questions as well. But do we need to actually push ourselves that little bit further to make sure that disabled athletes know about it? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Handley, do you want to come back on any of that? Or do you want me to pass over to uh, Derek Higton? Um, I'm happy. You know, I can agree with an awful lot of what's been said. Obviously, this is a, a scheme that's open to everybody, and the communications team did a uh, promotion, and we can only respond to the applications we receive. Maybe as local councillors, we have a responsibility to make sure that the clubs in our area get to know about it uh, through our own devices, but it, it's obviously um, something that is widely accepted as a very positive scheme uh, and I think the team do an excellent job in trying to reach as many people as they, as they can. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, Derek, do you want to come back on anything at all? Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, just to pick up on the specific um, questions then uh, that uh, members have asked, as far as um, uh, uh, Councillor Guilfoyle uh, providing a breakdown of um, uh, the, the kind of disciplines by, uh, sporting disciplines by uh, district, uh, we can certainly do that uh, and we can get that out to members um, in the coming um, days and weeks. Not a problem um, at all. Uh, 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 as far as um, Councillor Hollis, your question around promotion, 
um, is concerned. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's in uh, everybody's interest, isn't it, that we promote it as widely as, uh, as we possibly can and through as many channels um, as we can. Uh, and we're more than happy to work with district council partners uh, and community sports um, partnerships at the district level as well um, to, to get that message out. That That is something that we've, we think that we've done, but if there are, if there are um, channels that we could use more effectively, uh, then um, Cathy and the team would be more than happy to pick that up um, uh, with you um, uh, in respect of um, Ashfield and obviously in respect of uh, other members and other parts of the uh, county as well. Thank you, Derek. Uh, uh, Councillor Wheeler, do you a sh short word? Sorry, Tom, I'll come back to you in a moment. There was one other I question. I was going to say... Oh, I'm sorry, gonna... sorry. I've, I've interrupted Derek. I'm not doing very well at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> OK, I... Derek. Uh, and Councillor Cream, it was just that that, that that last question you asked around the, the kind of is any mount ring fence for um, disabled um, young athletes? Not at present. Uh, the the follow on question, um, should it be, I think is a really good question. And I think that's something that perhaps we uh, at an officer level will, will give consideration to um, for the coming year's um, awards. Um, it, I, I suppose what, what mitigates against that to a certain extent is the fact that we, we aren't dealing with an overall large sum of money. Um, so we've just got to be careful about chopping it up into chunks, if you like, that are potentially uh, too small and might um, have a, a different effect than that which we hope. Um, but it's absolutely a really good um, question. So I'll ask colleagues to give that consideration when we look at next year's scheme. Right, Councillor Wheeler, then I'll come back to Councillor Hollis for obviously a question back. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like, like to endorse the wonderful work the team do, and John does as well with the team. Uh, the, in terms of publicity, getting the information out, if it hasn't already been mentioned, if it has, I apologise. Respiratory Y is a great place to advertise such wonderful initiatives. It gets out an awful lot of people, not just in Westbury for so something perhaps the team could consider. Thank you, John. Thank you. Councillor Hollis. No, and really just to reiterate the offer that um, Derek, whoever is in your communications team, you're more than welcome to have at least half a page or possibly a full page of our council magazine, which goes out four times a year. So uh, please, at the most appropriate point, um, we'll just need a month's notice so we can put it in. That'd be we'll great. That up. Yeah. Uh, ju just to say from my personal point of view, I do go round all my clubs and tell them it's coming up next September or whenever it is as well. So they're on the lookout. OK, thank you very much. No yeah, other speakers. Yeah, yeah man, on a point of clarification, and no, no disrespect to Derek, what he said, yeah. but surely would it not be a paper that comes to members for members to decide on whether there is a scheme for people with disabilities as opposed to officers making that decision? Uh, yes. I thought yes. that's how the council worked. That was all. Right. It does. That's how it works. Yeah. I think De Derek was uh, <laughs> trying to give you the impression that they were going to have a look at it and then come and talk to members about it. So, yeah. Uh, that's all. I just thank you. Yeah. No problem. He's smiling at me. I can see him over the other, the other side yeah, of the room. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Glyn. I know we've okay. got best of intentions. It's yeah, well, he, he sports Derby, you see, so, you know, yeah. there you go. Yeah, um, they do need help, yeah. <laughs> right, OK, we'll go to um, the vote then, please. Anybody voting against? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. We'll take that as unanimous. Thank you. Item 10 is the Asher Lane, Musters Road and Top Road, Ruddington, prohibitation, pro prohibitation of waiting traffic regulation order. I think, uh, Doug, would you like to say a few words, please? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, members and uh, officers. Yes, the purpose of this report is to consider the objections received in respect of the traffic regulation order in Asher Lane, Masters Road and Top Road in Ruddington. Um, the proposals are in response to a planning requirement associated with a housing development. Uh, following consultation, some amendments were made to uh, reduce the restrictions that were put in place. Uh, details of the revised um, proposals were sent back to all the objectors. The details of the remaining objectors, including Reddington Parish Council, are in included within the report together with the responses. I'd just li like to note that the local member, Councillor Adair, uh, does not support the proposed housing development because of the concern of additional traffic, but is uh, does have no objection to the introduction of the proposed waiting restrictions. Uh, the recommendation is that the um, order is made uh, as published, as uh, indicated on page 64 of the pack. Thank you very much, Doug. I propose that uh, recommendation. 
I have a seconder, please. Yeah, I'll second that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? OK, I'm going to move to the vote then. Um, any members wish to vote against? Any abstain? Then uh, it's agreed unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, can we then go on to the uh, Ascombe Road and High Street East Markham prohibition? I can never get that of waiting traffic regulation order 2021. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, the purpose of this report is to consider the objections associated with the traffic regulation order prohibition of waiting at Ascombe Road and High Street East Markham. Again, this is in uh, the proposals are in response to a planning requirement uh, associated with an extension to the school. Uh, a number of responses were received. It was re-looked at and some slight amendments made. Uh, those were put back to the objectors. Details of the objectors, uh, including those from East Markham Parish Council, together with uh, responses, are within the report. Uh, the local member, Councillor Ogle, did support the proposals and the recommendation on page 75 is that the traffic regulation order is made as advertised. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'll propose that recommendation. Seconder, please. Yeah, again, happy to second. Thank you, Chairman. Anybody wish to speak or make comment? Councillor Ogle. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, it's the northern route out onto the A57 from East Markham Primary School. Uh, the primary school stands on the east of the road. It is the only... The A57. Um, I used to say... We keep losing you, John. The second time. We keep losing him. Occasionally passed here when I didn't go on the bus. And with, um, the, uh, with more working mothers, uh, the children have dropped off. I'm sorry, John. We can't hear you. The parish council. Which bit have you got, John? Have you got anything? Not, not much, John. No, you, you've gone three times now. Oh, I've been getting this most minutes. Uh, I've had a job, but uh, I'm sorry, we lost you again. I think the for ten, um, you, your signal's going all the I think time. We better I think... pass, pass John, but this is okay. You okay, okay with okay? Pa pass on then. And thank you. Thanks for it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I don't think so. We move to the vote then. Anybody voting against? Anybody? Any abstentions? We'll take that as um, re recommended. Thank you. Um, item 12 is, it says re response to petitions, but I think there's only one. So response to petition um, presented to the chairman of the county council. It was the one that we pulled last time. I don't know if anybody wishes to speak or say anything, but I will propose that we accept the uh, uh, report. A seconder, thank you. Again, happy to second, Chairman, thank you. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, Adrian, anything? Are you okay? No, it was just I was on hand to offer members any uh, further updates if they needed it, but uh, it looks like members are, are happy to, to accept this one and go to the recommendation. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, we'll go to the vote then. Any abstentions? Anybody against? And that's a majority vote. Thank you very much. Unanimous. Um, I'll now move to the work programme. Thank you. Any inputs or anything to say? Councillor Creamer, I've got. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's an item that only literally kept, I became aware of last night, and that's uh, would be worth a future suggestion about the bus services in, in and around Gedling or the boundary of the city area. The L9, which is majority paid for by the city, but runs through Mapley and into Arnold, they're actually, the service may actually be withdrawn. So it might be worth it sometime seeing how our services and our, our constituents are affected by outside bodies that work through us. 
So I'm not quite sure how that would go and fit in, and it's obviously going to be future work, but it's just a suggestion for a future uh, timetable. Thank you, Councillor Creamer. I am aware of it. I was made aware of it a couple of days ago. I think there's about four services that the city offer into the county at the moment. I know there's certainly one in Westbridgeford, and I think there is two others. And um, Pete Matheson is already on the case with it, looking into it. Okay. So we, w we will be coming back to members affected in that on that. To, on those services. Thank you, Chair. It doesn't go through my patch, but it skirts the edge and a lot of my constituents use it. Yeah, OK. Well, we'll we will consult with people to look at what we can do. So we'll come back to people. OK, uh, members. Uh, Councillor Greaves, I've got uh, your hand up. You're just muted, I think. Yeah, you're still muted, Councillor Greaves. I'm, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Chairman, just, just for clarity, uh, at, at the last uh, meeting at uh, Communities and Place, we voted on uh, eight items of the agenda for this meeting, which uh, four of them has been taken out. Can you tell me what, what's the purpose of voting for them if half of them is going to be taken out? Just a, just a point of clarity, please, Chairman. All I, all I can say, Kevin, is I think it's where we are in the cycle and what's going forward. So um, we do put things in and do move things around. If you've got any particular issues that you want to put in, then please let me know. OK. Glyn, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I'll just, if, if you would allow me, flood risk management update. Uh, I just wanted to actually place on record my thanks to the team uh for the preparations that they made uh, and i'm sure kevin and other members of bassett law will echo it the fact that they uh, had a video conference with us uh prior to uh the uh, rainfall coming uh discuss with us problem areas that we would have uh and where possible uh so solutions i.e by getting uh, sandbags etc in place ready uh, and that work really did go down well with the public who, who have been suffering in the past and I, I just want to pay uh, tribute and thanks to the team for that preparation that they did and I'm, I'm thankfully uh, in our area we didn't have to use it um, but um, the fact that we were uh, preemptive and we were working uh, in front as opposed to playing catch up which is what we've happened you know sometimes um, the people, the public were really, really uh, pleased with it. So I pass my thanks on, uh, and I know the uh, rest of the Bassett Law members to uh, the flood team. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for that. And I will pass it on. Um, Councillor Rostens and myself have uh, been keeping eyes on what's gone off this time round as well to try and make it more um, helpful to people and more responsive. And you will all be getting an email today um, because I've worked with um, Sue Jakes and the team to get together a report for MPs for yep. their area and also for members yourselves to get, which you should I say should be in your email box today. It, it is, and, Chairman, I've read it, thanks. It's and I'm, cool. I'm quite happy for people to come back and uh, give more information and details to those reports if they feel that uh, we're missing out on something because we're trying to scope it all in. And I'm quite happy if uh, Councillor Rostens wants to say a few words just to wind up. No, just again, thanks to Sue and the team. We had the same in Ashfield. We had the meeting with with um, with Sue, highlighting our areas and the work that they've done to prepare. Like uh, Councillor Gilfoyle Gilfo uh, said, gave us those reassurances going forward that uh, we got support needed if anything did uh, happen this time around. So yeah, great work to Sue and the team, and uh, a really good follow up. I've had a couple of emails today. Um, given us those reports, so I look forward to, to looking over there. Thanks, John. OK. Thank you then, everybody. Thank you for your input today. And uh, I'll see you next month, if not before. Cheerio. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks.